lose time. Uh, welcome everyone on behalf of Sydney Health Partners and Monash Partners. Um, I'm delighted to welcome you all to the webinar today. My name is Angela Todd. I'm from Sydney Health Partners and I will be co-hosting today's event with Angela Jones from Monash Partners. Um, as you uh, know, the, the focus for today is uh, on reaching out and engaging with migrant and refugee, refugee communities about uh, clinical trials. So um, we might progress to the next slide, please. Thanks. Um, before we get into the program, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the many lands on which we're meeting today and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. Um, I'm on the lands of the Camaragal people of the Eora Nation on the north side of Sydney. And um, I acknowledge the many traditional owners of the lands on which our audience come from as well. Um, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, we have a very full agenda today. We'll uh, be starting with two speakers who are going to give us some um, perspectives of things that are happening nationally to support consumer involvement in clinical trials, particularly from called communities. Uh, we'll then have a conversation with three women who are working together on a clinical trial. Um, we then have a, a, a researcher perspective on working with um, people from um, ethnic communities. And finally, we'll have a Q&A session and some closing remarks at the end. So session is due to go from 11 to 12.30 uh, Eastern Standard Time. And um, I think it's going to be a terrific program. And thank you for joining us. Next slide, thanks. Uh, just a reminder that this is the fourth webinar in a, in a series that uh, Sydney Health Partners and Monash Partners has co-hosted over the last couple of years. Um, if you're interested in any of the previous webinars and the topics are here on screen, um, there are links available both through the Sydney Health Partners and the Monash Partners websites uh, of recordings of those other webinars. We also provide a, a short summary to everyone who's registered for these events that gives you some uh, links and other highlights. So uh, please don't be concerned about catching um, everything that's uh, discussed or mentioned. We will be sending um, a summary to, to everyone. Uh, finally, uh, just a housekeeping, if you could please use the Q&A to post your questions and then just save the chat for other comments that would really be helpful to our speakers. Okay, um, next slide, please. Um, as far as I'm aware, um, I think our first speaker, John Stubbs, may be running late. So I'm going to instead uh, swap um, speakers and we're going to start with Mohammed El Kafaji um, as our first speaker. And I'm really delighted that Mohammed can join us. Um, as you probably know from the uh, bio information that was provided, Mohammed is the Chief Executive Officer of the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia, also known as FECA, um, which is the peak national body representing Australians from culturally and linguistically diverse backgrounds. Um, Mohammed actually has a number of other hats, and I'm sure he's going to share that with you. And one of the uh, one of the hats that he has is that he um, is involved in the MRFF uh, consumer panel that has recently recently released guidelines around um, involving consumers in MRFF funded research. And we've invited Mohammed to talk a little bit about what those guidelines might mean for um, engaging with core communities. So over to you, Mohammed, and thanks very much. Thank you, Angela. Um, and hi, everyone. My name is Mohamed Akfaj. I'm the CEO of the Federation of Ethnic Communities Councils of Australia. And I'm delighted to be with you here today. I'd like to start by acknowledging that um, I am meeting you on, on the lands of the Ngunnawal and Ngambri people here in Canberra. It's freezing uh, here in Canberra. I flew in this morning. Um, and I'd like to acknowledge uh, their elders past and present. Um, and I'd also like to uh, celebrate uh, uh, Re World Refugee Day uh, today, and what an occasion to hold this uh, webinar. Um, so my involvement with MRFF as a consumer um, rep is to ensure that um, 
the guidelines and everything that MRFF does is inclusive, is inclusive of migrant communities and people who English is not their, may not be their first language or, um, you know, people from refugee and uh, migrant backgrounds. And I think uh, some of those principles are very similar to um, how you engage First Nations people, for example. And I think the, the easiest way to think about it, for me anyway, is to kind of put yourself in the shoe of a, um, you know, someone who has migrated to Australia either as a refugee um, and pretend that you don't speak English. Um, and then the challenges of engaging someone in clinical trials will become fairly obvious. Obviously, the first one is about building trust. Uh, the second one is about obviously communication and making sure that you can communicate uh, with that person and also making sure that uh, you explain and that education part of what is a clinical trial, why it's important to um, involve um, consumers from all walks of life. Uh, so there is that uh, health literacy component to it and also making sure that the, when we, you know, when we seek feedback or um, experiences um, from people with lived experience, uh, we need to ensure that that's done in a culturally safe manner, but also we need to, uh, you know, acknowledge the experience that they're sharing. Um, so not everything is for free and we can't just expect people just to be available for us whenever we need them with a drop of a hat and, um, you know, tell us what you think about this clinical trials. It takes time, it's hard work. Um, I think I think it's hard work regardless of who you try and recruit as a for a clinical trial, even if they speak English, let alone people who English might not be the first language, um, you know, might be from recently arrived migrant or refugee background. So there are added layers of complexities which we need to first understand and be um, cognizant of and you know, start to address them um, in a culturally sensitive and culturally appropriate manner. That doesn't mean that, you know, we put all of our, you know, uh, red flags start coming up and saying, okay, well, this is too hard because we we think we're going to offend someone or we're not going to, we don't have the cultural competency to do it. I think the, the first thing to, to do is make sure that you are, you commit yourself to uh, recruit people from, diverse backgrounds, not just from migrant and refugee backgrounds, but all walks of life. Obviously, the, the latest census shows us that um, over 52% of the population were either born overseas or have at least one parent born overseas. About 22.5% of the population speak a language other than English at home. So it's not a small sect of the population that we need to do special things for. This is the population. And... Um, I believe it is unacceptable in this day and age to exclude people who English is not their first language from clinical trials. And I just want to acknowledge the um, amazing work that the Australian Clinical Trials Alliance has been doing and you know, the, the importance that they've put uh, on this topic to, uh, to get up where it's up to uh, is really commendable. So I'm sure John will be talking about the um, the MRFF uh, principles for consumer involvement. Um, so I won't steal his thunder, but just to kind of um, mention them broadly, they are, um, you know, in every uh, type of research, at all stages of research, in partnership with researchers, effectively, sensitively, and safely with broad diversity and equity. Um, and these new principles have actually been endorsed by the minister, uh, which is really wonderful to hear. And I think now it's up to us, um, you know, uh, it's up to researchers to ensure um, that they include people from all walks of, all walks of life um, and ensure that uh, we do everything to remove barriers for participation for people from migrant or refugee background. Um, and we acknowledge that involving people from our communities is difficult because a the trust needs to be built so that takes time um you know remunerating people from uh from uh, you know uh, i suppose as uh clinical trials is it is not cheap and also um allocating resources for interpreters and um translation 
is uh, is expensive as well. And we all know that there is only a limited amount of funding to go around for this type of um, research. But uh, I think things are slowly changing, and I'm really heartened to to hear about um, some of the wonderful work um, a lot of people are doing in this field. So I might leave it there, um, and I'm sure John has a lot more interesting things to say, and I'm looking forward to hear um, what other researchers are doing in this field. Thank you. Thanks so much, Mohammed. I really appreciate that perspective. Um, okay, uh, I'm really delighted to introduce our next speaker, uh, John Stubbs. Uh, John is um, um, a very highly regarded and well-known consumer advocate. Um, he was personally diagnosed with chronic myeloid leukemia about 20 years ago and um, was um, involved in clinical trials himself. He's become a, a passionate advocate for people who are affected by cancer and chronic disease. Um, he has, uh, uh, he does wear uh, uh, numerous hats, both at national and state levels on various committees and uh, uh, working groups. Um, in addition to chairing the MRFF consumer panel nationally, um, he's also a member of ACTA and today is going to talk to us about um, the work that ACTA has been doing to try and support greater consumer engagement in clinical trials. Um, um, and I'm just going to organise uh, your slides, John, if you just bear with me. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me, thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, I'm Sorry, I'm a little bit late. I'm speaking at the TROG Transradiation Oncology Group uh, meeting here in Adelaide and, and speaking about clinical trials and how we can attract more and more people to, to clinical trials. So, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you very much, Maham. Um, excuse me. Thank you very much, Mohammed, for, 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 your, for your talk. Um, yes, I'm going to talk to you today about what ACTA has been doing in, in this space. We've been working for some time with a group of committed um, consumers and, and researchers to, to set some framework and set some ground rules for engaging people from called communities in clinical trials. Uh, next slide, please, Angela. So I acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we live, work and meet today and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. We extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Thank you. <coughs> um, as Mohammed has, has indicated, Australia is a multicultural and lingual, oh, excuse me. <coughs> Diverse community. Oh. <clears throat> oh, I do apologize, everybody. I'm so sorry. And we have some statistics about language and, and numbers of people from call groups in, in Australia. And this number is increasing. And so there is an absolute pool, a rich pool of potential patients to be enrolled in clinical trials. And we need to make that um, introduction and that availability, um, it's, it's got to become a tenant of our health system. Thank you, um, Angela. So um, in, from 2019 to 2020, I was involved with Actin. We did an environmental scan. We had national workshops and reports, and we identified national statements and also to develop guiding principles, awareness, access, and involvement for, for called people. And it was ACTA's view that participants in clinical research should reflect the diversity of our society and culture. That has, as I said, should become a tenant of, of, of our health system. We have um, the awareness, we have the involvement and the access. I think the awareness is front and centre, but we're probably lacking in relation to access involvement. And that's the way that we do things. And so clinical trials groups and re research people really have to change the way in which clinical trials are being addressed for, for members of the core community. A lot of the elements in relation to clinical trials regarding the protocols things are not applicable in our current day. 
because English has to be a first language. Um, understanding consent and all of those things is, is extremely difficult for people where English is not a first language. And as a result, many people are excluded from, I suppose, the initial ballot of a clinical trial. And um, thanks, Angela. And so um, in mid-22, Department of Health requested recommendations fo focusing on called populations and um, act as consumer group was, was consultant. Um, and we engaged with a consultancy firm to do the, to do the report and to, um, to table the recommendations. Um, we've had meetings with stakeholders from industry, clinical research, government, and consumer advocacy and, and consumers were, were interviewed. And then the draft recommendations for public targeted consultation period um, was was established. And so the recommendations have been submitted to the Department of Health in what we believe is, is an appropriate way to engage with the members of the call community and ensure that they are an integral part of access to clinical trials. Thanks, Angela. And so um, there was community-led engagement and in involvement in relation to these recommendations. Um, embedding learning and building capability to support sustainable called inclusion was a, a, one of the guiding principles and strengthening of a national clinical trial system to promote inclusion for called people. One of the, um, I think one of the elements in, in Australia is that we are in a federated system and that does make it a little bit difficult as, as states do their 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 own thing. Um, now that's not a. It's I'm not saying it's a criticism. It's just the way the health systems, and the way data collection and the way clinical trials are set up. However, um, the guiding principles have been established, and um, with a slightly different hat on for the moment through the NRF, MRFF, um, of which Muhammad is an integral member of the community reference group, the guiding principles are there for the inclusion of called, uh, for the inclusion of the called community. Um, thanks, Angela. And so um, the key things across the clinical trial circuit, design and application, uh, conduct and analysis, dissemination and implementation, and also the identification and prioritization. So we need to engage with the communities to ensure that these four elements uh, become an integral part of the clinical trial life cycle. And these themes to be adopted by researchers and consumers alike in developing better outcomes for our patients. Thanks, Angela. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, really, really helpful overview of uh, the work that that ACTA has been doing and that you've been involved with. And as you say, um, ACTA's really demonstrated some great leadership in this area. And um, um, we will be including uh, some uh, links to the various reports on engaging with core communities that um, ACTA has produced. And thanks, Joe, jo for putting some links in, in the chat. Um, Okay, um, I think we're just going to, uh, as we mentioned in, in early on, uh, we're going to save any uh, responses to questions until the end of the session. So uh, please for, forgive me, but um, someone is monitoring the questions that you're posting. Um, we're going to move now to a conversation with three people who have been working together uh, on a research project that's being led through the University of Technology, Sydney. Um, I'm really delighted to introduce our three um, guests. So Nadine L. Cavut is a physiotherapist, uh, sorry, psychotherapist and a life coach. And her own personal journey with cancer was some years ago, um, but it really introduced her to some of the challenges of navigating the health system and really pushed her into a variety of voluntary and advocacy roles um, in the areas of cancer for Muslims for youth and for the broader multicultural communities. And um, I've now had the, the good fortune to work with Nadine on a couple of other initiatives and she's absolutely passionate about um, her work. 
Um, Dr. Rayanne Salamusa is a postdoctoral research fellow with uh, cancer symptom trials at the University of Technology, Sydney. Uh, she's got a number of research programs, but the one that she's joining us about today is a program of research focused on improving uh, called community access to and participation in cancer clinical trials. And finally, uh, but not least, Awa Abu Samri Samra is a, a Palestinian Australian, but also a certified Arabic interpreter. And um, Awa has been working with Nadine and Rayan on uh, the, the, the same uh, cancer clinical trial project. Um, Awa has got a lot of experience in working with core communities and um, works across a, a range of areas, including medical, legal, and community spaces. So she brings a lot of experience as a, an interpreter for the last 10 years. So I'm absolutely delighted um, to have our three women joining us. Um, I might invite them to uh, put their cameras on if they haven't already. Um, and uh, perhaps we can just start off with a conversation around um, the three of you telling us a little bit about um, the project that brought you together and uh, the different roles that you play in that project. Uh, perhaps, uh, Rayanne, I might ask you to kick off. Thank you, Angela, and good morning, everyone on the line. Um, I'd like to begin by acknowledging that I am dialing in from Daru country in southwestern Sydney today um, and pay my respect to their elders past and present. Um, so as mentioned, I am the postdoc with Cancer Symptom Trials. And um, for anyone who does not know much about us, we are one of 14 um, cancer cooperative trial groups that are funded through Cancer Australia. And I'm currently leading this program of research that um, is aiming to improve diversity and inclusion um, within cancer clinical trials for people from cold communities. Our initial focus is with the Arabic speaking community um, and we hope to expand into other cold communities as we progress. So um, to date, a lot of the research literature has focused on the patient-sided barriers um, and very little attention has been given to um, any barriers or enablers that are occurring at the clinical trial sponsor or site level. And so for for our very first um, study, we are running a series of focus groups with researchers and healthcare professionals to better understand uh, what is happening at this level, um, what's working, what is not. And um, this study is ongoing. And if you are interested in participating, please reach out to me via my UTS account. Um, you can find that just by Googling my name. Um, I guess when bringing together an investigator team for this program, it was very important for me to have not only the relevant expertise, but I really wanted this team to be representative of the community that we were serving. Um, and I guess there are many cultural and spiritual nuances and intersections that unless you are from within the community or you have spent a considerable time immersing yourself in the community and building that relationship, um, you won't quite grasp. And so it was very important that the members of our investigator team um, either had that insight themselves or could be guided by that holistic insight by other members of the team. And so I'm really excited to have um, both the wonderful uh, ladies that are joining me on the panel today, Arwa and Nadine, um, on our investigator team. And I guess I'll, I'll let them introduce themselves and their role on the um, uh, research team. Thank you. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, Nadine, do you want to go next? Yeah, um, so my major function as a consumer representative is to bring the consumer perspective to all decision making and to work with other members of the project team to build solutions that work and address the problems identified. So this is done by presenting and arguing the consumer's point of view, developing alternative solutions or compromises which enable consumer needs to be met, contributing to the overall role and direction of the project, is undeniable that the collaborative approaches between researchers and community advocates will improve medical research, treatment protocols, referral pathways, and clinical trial access. It also improves relationships, allows for a better assessment of community needs and preferences, as well as enhances trust and communication. Fantastic. <laughs> Thanks, Nadine. And Awa. 
Um, hello, everybody, and um, it's a pleasure to actually be with you um, this morning, or should I say, no, not quite yet this afternoon, but um, my role as an Arabic, a certified Arabic interpreter, interpreting for the Arabic speaking community in so many different spaces. Um, I've had the pleasure of um, being in my profession for the past 10 years, and I guess the flip side to seeing how some of the systems and services that um, employ us as, um, um, you know, people who allow us to give access, you know, equitable access um, for people who don't speak English, um, uh, it kind of it's a bird's eye view of what isn't working and all the gaps that do exist in systems that don't cater for people who come with um, you know intersectional sort of you know uh, issues that they may need to be, have addressed. So um, I guess for me, um, Brian didn't really have to do much convincing. Um, I always like to be a part of anything that helps uplift. Um, any um, uh, migrant communities or in particular for me because I speak Arabic, the Arabic speaking community and, you know, sort of watching them, I guess, be more represented in things that will help change things is um, was something that was a big driving force for me. So Rayanne did not really have to convince me much. Um, I also, um, I probably think that maybe I'm a little bit more outspoken about what I do in the translation and interpreting space. And um, that may have been the draw card to um, for Rayanne to sort of invite me on board. But um, it's really wonderful to see that um, there is, uh, you know, work in that space that addresses the issues that Rayan had mentioned. Thank you, Awa. Um, can I maybe ask Nadine and Awa if you could tell us a little bit about how you got interested in being involved in health research and clinical trials? And really, how did you find each other? How did you connect with Rayan? <laughs> Do you want to go, Awa? <laughs> Well, I, I guess all Rayanne's, um, uh, you know, it's probably one of the things that we're going to touch on later, but um, I, I guess it's that out, sort, of, it's sort of being outspoken and really being an advocate for my profession, you know, um, sort of seeing um, a lot of, um, I guess, professional ignorance about how to utilise interpreters and how translation can be used effectively. And um, I guess I'm very um, vocal online with that. So maybe that was where you caught me, Rayanne. But um, uh, it's, um, it's wonderful to be able to use any kind of platform especially because um, uh, having, you know, being, being a published author and, and all of that um, helps bring attention to sort of these issues in a, in a different light and being a member of that community. But um, I think that for me, it was, um, it was about um, something that I knew, it, you know, a light bulb moment went on for me and I thought this is something that I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't knock it back. Um, I, I think I've even told Ryan at one point that I'm happy to, I'm happy to, um, you know, kick back, you know, paid work just to be a part of that investigative team, because I see that that progress and that um, those, the, that very important research needs to be, needs to be um, done. And um, yeah, that was it for me. It was very attractive to be um, uh, included as the voice of interpreters, I guess. Nadine? For me, it was back in 2013. It wasn't an ideal for me, ideal year for me. I was diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is a blood cancer, and little guidance existed on how best to communicate and navigate the health system and other connected services. And despite my ability to speak English and be, being a local resident, I still encountered many obstacles and challenges at many points of my health journey that weren't culturally and spiritually attuned. So I thought to myself, if I'm struggling, what about others who don't have the privileges that I do? So my journey with cancer seven years ago and the ongoing challenges navigating the health system pushed me into a variety of consume uh, into a variety of volunteer and advocacy roles for cancer, Muslims, uh, youth, and multicultural community communities into um, that focuses on the delivery of culturally and spiritually attuned services and equitable healthcare, as well as creating a uh, positive roadmap experiences and journey for these communities where their values, needs and preferences are honoured. So they had reached out to me, I believe last year, mid-year, and I immediately jumped on board. Like, I'm also vocal online in what I participate in and why I participate in it. I truly believe consumers bring an essential and unique perspective that enables health service providers to become aware of the importance of working within diversity and not with diversity of consumer needs, understanding and addressing consumer values and needs can positively influence both healthcare experiences and future health healthcare seeking behaviours. I find bringing, it, um, bringing issues to attention could lead to many benefits. The study of one underserved community may yield generalizable knowledge applicable to a larger group of 
minoritized populations. And a targeted intervention for one group may lead to the benefits of people outside of this group. And that's why I joined. <laughs> Fantastic. All right. Um, can you can you all perhaps tell me um, and tell our audience how how are health research and clinical trials viewed by your local communities? Um, what are the challenges for you when you're speaking to other members of your communities about health research? Where do we begin? <laughs> <laughs> I guess um, the, the, the best part of that is to throwing the first word out there, which is trust is a huge issue. So there's no trust in, in, that, in that relationship. And that trust is not something that is built upon, I think, a first interaction. It's something that is built over many, many different um, interactions and meaningful interactions where they're the focus, I guess, of um, that interaction rather than an afterthought. So I think um, Rayanne and Nadine and I have spoken before about how that's a major factor. Rayanne, I don't know, you wanted to jump in there and I cut you off. No, 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 that's fine. Keep going. <laughs> Yeah, so it's definitely um, it's definitely something that I experience, I guess, in my role as an interpreter, where there's always a sort of almost a level of suspicion onto, you know, why they're sort of seeking to engage at particular points, for example, in treatment, in engagement, and you know, there's there's no lead to it. There's a lot of the time where there's no lead to it. So, you know, when you come into sort of a community and they, you know, I guess being in that role of, of the interpreter, um, you know, we we professionally don't want to be the mediators for these um, situations because you shouldn't have to be mediating for a client who's seeking a service from a professional body um, uh, on other on anything else other than language facilitation but to have to be put in a position where they're looking for you they're looking for answers from through you is this something I trust have you been come across this before what is this is all um, mm -hmm. is all definitely communicated in my interaction with people that I've interpreted for in the Arabic community. I think um, one of the biggest challenges that I've faced um, when communicating with people from the community are uh, the intersections with faith and culture and, and what that means. And so um, Western medicine and or research leans towards the um, the notion of survival at all costs, um, whereas in Islam, in, in my community, the concept of survival is not confined to life on earth. And we believe that there is um, an afterlife and that this life is just a stepping stone towards that. And so, um, and we are promised, um, you know, uh, many wonderful things and heaven, if you are good and patient with all that um, this life brings your way, good and the bad. Um, and so, Things like health complications are viewed as a test from God um, and also a, as a blessing because it provides a means of um, cleansing one's sins. Um, so then when you come into um, the context of clinical research and um, as a patient, we would be balancing um, the risks and the benefits. And not only um, in terms of risks, not just the medical implications, but also any religious implications. So, uh, you know, with us, we're taught that our body is a temporary vessel, that it's on loan from God. Um, and so we start to question, is it permissible for me to be experimenting and going on a trial drug? Um, and so when there is that ambiguity um, with, with the religious side of things, um, the common response is to exercise caution. And so people will probably avoid experimental um, research for that reason. Um, some people even avoid conventional medic medicine that has been proven to work um, for that reason as well. So um, I guess, yeah, coming back to participation in clinical research, sometimes the decision-making process will consider the views of religious leaders or community leaders, and it will almost always be a family decision, not an individual one. Mm -hmm. And when you're trying to recruit, so putting my clinical researcher hat on, when you're trying to recruit people in short time frames, like we have a study now that we're trying to recruit within 24 hours of people being admitted, we do face those challenges because there are so many things that are going through the mind of someone from uh, our community in particular um, that they need to consider before they can make that decision. Mm. I don't and know. If you, it, it sounds like that's not necessarily a quick decision you can make on the spot. No, no. Yeah, understand. Uh, Nadine, did you want to add in your thoughts? 
Yeah, as a consumer representative, uh, from, from a consumer perspective, clinical research can come across as scary words. So fear is a major factor behind people's reluctance to take part in clinical research, perhaps due to a legacy of major uh, historical violations of ethical standards. But this also stems from the fact for too long, research was an activity done to or on oppressed marginalised people. It was something imposed from the outside. So uh, like Arwa had mentioned, there's a degree of mistrust amongst the community towards the scientific community or of research institutions due to awareness of unethical practices on part of the medical research community in the past or a perception that academic institutions are elitist and not, com not committed to the welfare of ethnically minoritized communities. But also it's not just how research and clinical trials are viewed, but how it makes us feel when we encounter it systemically. And most times this isn't just because we don't speak English. You know, there are cultural and communication barriers, language barriers such as in English proficiency, professional jargon and misinterpretation of body language, low success in clinical trial recruitment due to perceived lack of information about the purpose, procedures and the value of clinical trials uh, that patients have been asked to contribute to, issues associated with complex forms and informed consent procedures, failing to communicate research findings within communities, also structural barriers such as practical barriers to accessing services and lack of knowledge of understanding of services that are available, also opportunity barriers such as barriers to research process. For example, people with low levels of literacy are routinely excluded from many clinical trials because they are viewed as unable to provide truly informed consent. Most research protocols do not engage with language proficiency at all. Furthermore, when clinicians believe the cost or burden of data collection are too great, they are less likely to refer or recruit patients to clinical trials. Also, service-related barriers, such as models of service, is culturally inappropriate. Patients or consumers' reluctance to engage with services because of concern they will not be understood or will be stereotyped and judged. I know that all sounded negative, but we can redress these structures, systems, and power imbalances that continue to characterize much academic research, which can limit the ability of certain groups to participate meaningfully in research. It may seem impossible to dismantle years of history in a single project or projects, no matter how much goodwill the researchers and community establishes together. But by practically involving and empowering community advocates in community-led research, it builds a foundation of real relationships, mutual respect, and true reciprocation. Look, uh, I, it's really interesting. Across the three of you, I, I, I heard some, uh, I mean, I guess for me, light bulb moments. You know, the issue of trust is something that comes up all the time, not just with core communities, with many um, patient and, and consumer groups. And I think researchers really um, are challenged to understand that um, how, how significant a, a role that plays and the importance of investing the time in building trust and building relationships. Um, I also thought, Rayanne, your, your comment about the, the different understandings of, of medicine and, and your own personal health were really important. Um, obviously, you're, you're talking um, about Arabic communities and one can only wonder how that might be different in other communities, for example, from Africa, you know, um, their beliefs about, around their own health and, and the role of medicine. So um, I can really understand um, the, important, the importance of, of really learning about those, those beliefs and cultures. Um, you've, you, the three of you have actually mentioned some systemic barriers and I've seen some commentary in the chat, even you know, practical logistical things like the difficulties of booking interpreters um, and the demands on interpreters. Um, but, but Nadine, you, you, you did have a very long list of systemic issues, um, language literacy being among them. Um, maybe we could just talk a little bit more about those systemic issues and um, uh, how you think we can start to turn things around a little bit. You know, if, if because as you said, Nadine, we can't undo it all in one research study, but we can all start working towards um, more positive experiences with engaging um, people from other communities. Um, let's start with, you know, what would be the first one you'd pick off off the top of your head? Where where would you start? Um, yeah. Go, Nadine, you can do that, yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, there's some practical examples you can investigate immediately. 
So expression of interest forms. When asking consumers to join your research teams, committees, boards, et cetera, through an expression of interest, we make that process too complicated to complete and often ask for unnecessary information, such as what's your occupation, what skills do you have, what other member organizations are you affiliated with? I mean, why don't you just ask them for their resume or a job interview while you're at it? And what's even worse, it's a compulsory question that doesn't allow you to miss it or move on or skip on to another question. We need to ask what the purpose of each question is and is it a deal breaker if they don't have it? If not, don't put it in the expression of interest form. Instead, ask about their lived experiences as a carer, patient, family, community member. Ask them why they're passionate about the courses they advocate for. Ask them how... Um, you can help them participate in research. Do they need training? Do you want to have a discussion? Um, also websites. Are your websites consumer friendly, easy to access and navigate without complicated jargon? Do they have multiple communication options? They'll increase the chances of having them on board. Acronyms. Please have an ongoing list of acronyms to provide during their onboarding. Have it at the back of every meeting agenda issued. Don't assume we know because most times we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. A really practical place to start. Uh, Awa. Okay, so a very practical place to start. Of course, and I'm going to go back a little bit, just a very tiny bit and add to that is that when, for example, one issue that I would think that should be addressed by everybody who works with any material that needs to be translated is to actually understand what writing for translation actually looks like. So that would actually be a huge um, um, a, a starting point for many people who just think that they can um, put information in that they'd want to communicate to a community, for example, and it can be um, something that probably people within that same space would understand very easily. Um, but it's about simplifying complicated content and actually understanding that when you write for the purpose of translation, that information doesn't mean it's reduced or doesn't have everything that you need to cover. It's just written differently. Um, so that's the first starting point that can be achieved very quickly. I think that the, the other thing I'd like to say is um, uh, I want to acknowledge that the system was not built for the level of diversity that we have. The system exists as it is making adjustments to grow with the diversity that is growing daily. So when we understand that aspect of it, we know that for every professional, wherever they slot in, into whichever system they slot into, use that professional platform that you have to advocate for people so that they of minorities that they have better equitable access to information in general. So when we talk about funding and interpreters and translations costing so much, it should be a part of the conversation that's not had only by the minority groups who suffer at the receiving end of this. It should be spoken about by professionals who continue to advocate and make their voices and their platforms as a means to pushing for better, um, uh, better uh, resources better funding for these resources as, as we move forward. I don't think any professional in whatever scope that they do should ever accept the response of, we don't have an interpreter available. There is a volume of interpreters and translators within New South Wales and in uh, all over Australia that are able to provide professional service um, uh, at, any, at any point. And I think that rejecting that you, that you deliver any of your services without the presence of a qualified interpreter should be something that is from within your power um, and, and to push for that. So those are just two simple things that can be done immediately, really. Thanks, Awa. It's, um, I, I was just reflecting one of the first um, things that you mentioned when we first met was that um, Arabic is spoken in nearly 100 different countries. And I, I don't think the, you know, that doesn't mean that it's the same version of Arabic in every one of those countries and some of the nuances that um, you talked about. So um, the importance of interpreters um, who understand those differences and, as you say, communicating complex, potentially complex concepts in, in simpler ways is an important is an important message for, especially for researchers. Uh, Ray, from, from, from you, sorry. Um, Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, Ray, from your experience, where would you start with tackling some of those systemic issues? Um, I just love having these two women on my team because they've covered pretty much every point that I would have made. Um, it's fantastic. And, and what I love is that we, all three of us are usually very chatty and we're very well behaved not to talk over one another today, which is great. Um, look, I guess the only thing that I would add to all the the 
very important um, points that both Nadine and Anwar have already made is that um, our, um, as researchers, our mindset and the terminology that we are using, um, we're, we're often referring to language as a barrier and it's, it's a barrier from the patient's side. It's, it's because they just don't know how to speak English. Well, actually, no, this is a need that we are not meeting. We are failing to meet that need. And so when we start to shift that mindset and the way we are um, uh, referring to this, um, it, it, there's this, um, I guess, unspoken responsibility. It's it's us, the researchers and the healthcare professionals that need to be providing those linguistically appropriate and culturally appropriate resources. Um, when we want to open up our clinical trials, I'll, you know, we choose particular sites based on recruitment numbers, well, we need to be taking our research to where these populations are because a lot of them tend to cluster in certain regions. And so if we're just going to keep opening where we will have our typical Caucasian populations, yes, yeah, sure, we'll get our numbers, but we are not, have, we're not um, uh, improving that access and that diversity within our research. Um, and, and same goes with opening up in rural and regional um, areas as well. That that is all important in improving access um, to our clinical research. So yeah, I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. You know, the, the women on the line have already covered quite a lot of it. Thank you. I was also, just while you were talking, Ryan, I was thinking, you know, it's also crazy that um, uh, NHMRC and MRFF funding timeframes, you know, we have three years or five years of, to, you know, do all of that work, to build those relationships, to, to do that more sophisticated um, design of research projects. So there, 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 are, there are a number of systemic issues even with those. I was just going to say those relationships, we should be building them before we even apply for those grants. You're absolutely right. By the time we get to grant time, we would have had an established relationship. We know, you know, the, the costs that we need to incorporate into our funding budgets, whether we're including interpreters, translations, um, patient navigators, all of that would have been nutted out and, and worked out well before we've um, applied for those funding schemes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, we've got one last question. And I think we're almost out of time. So uh, quickly from each of you, if you had to give um, our, our audience uh, top tips uh, about working um, and engaging with consumers from um, ethnic communities, tell me, where would you start? What would be the first thing to do? Um, do not underestimate the importance of having diversity within your teams. Um, and not just from the expertise, but also uh, having representatives from within the communities. Um, there is, uh, I think Arwa said last time, there is no lack of skill in our communities, that there Absolutely. are professionals, um, we do exist, and yes. it's, there is a lack of fair opportunity. Um, so providing those opportunities for people that look like and speak like the community that you wish to serve, be in those leadership roles or in those investigator teams. Absolutely. Uh, and I second that, Rayanne. And I once heard something that made me think, oh, that's, that's really beautiful. It captures what I feel, um, which is the quote goes, the gap between me and you will be the death of us. So once we understand that, um, it, you know, uh, making space for people to actually be a part of a team, you know, um, pushing back on those um, sort of uh, almost um, uh, cookie cutter like um, image of what somebody who has to be on a, an investigative team or on a on a panel or anything like that. So including people and making space for them that, you know, you might surprise yourself and think, well, there's a whole lot of um, knowledge here and very valuable knowledge. And don't ever, ever underestimate how that process is going to actually enrich the, all of the processes of what, what you're doing. So, you know, making space um, in a way to say, um, somebody or a community needs to be represented, they actually need a physical representation, a member of them actually actively participating as equally and as fairly as everybody else who's contributing to that. So make that make that a part of your um, journey in being able to use your, your um, spaces of work or your positions of power or whatever it is that you're doing to actually make that process a lot easier um, and, and advocate for it. And also, I think the other thing is, you know, uh, look for that... Um, cultural awareness training that organizations do, that, that in itself can't be um, a one model fits all. It's got to be catered to specific groups. We need to be able to address the intersectionality of all of those groups. So seek it, ask for it in your spaces, in your workspaces, and make it, you know, make it apply. 
Uh, yeah. Tips for researchers that I would give would, would be uh, like multicultural communities have pre previously been an unidentified voiceless population in the healthcare system. So provide an opportunity for more champions to ensure that the disparity in care specific needs and the complex issues multicultural communities face continue to be recognized and featured on agendas so that their outcomes and experiences continue to improve. Also approach this with the long term in mind. It's social etiquette and networking 101. These are built on foundation of real relationships, mutual respect and true respiration. So stay in touch. For consumers, don't be afraid to reach out to people in the community you see involved in this space. Ask them questions, get involved if you're interested. We are more than happy to help you. And also don't feel you must completely commit to an organization, working group or research project where you're not meshing well together or you feel tokenized. Instead, raise constructive feedback and then mutually depart ways. There are incredible researchers and organizations out there who will value and honor your perspectives, needs and preferences, as well as empower your cause. You'll find them, so don't give up. Wow, what a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Nadine, Awa, and uh, Rayanne, for a really great conversation. I, look, I'm, I'm scanning the comments in the chat and I can't keep up with them. There's so many there. Really well done. Um, um, I think I have to hand over, sadly, <laughs> to Angela to uh, go on with our next speaker. But thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thanks, Ange. And thank you for your um, inspiring uh, conversation ladies, I think there's some absolute, um, the wisdom and your uh, perspectives are just fantastic. Thank you so much. It's now um, my great pleasure to introduce Jacqueline Boyle. Jackie's an academic obstetrician and gynaecologist, and she's the head of the Health Systems and Equity Platform at Eastern Health Clinical School, which is part of Monash University here in Melbourne. Jackie's research interests are around health equity across women's public health, um, implementing health research into practice and systems to improve women's health across the life course. She has extensive experience working with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities in the Northern Territory, but also with uh, refugee communities across the southeast of Melbourne. Um, and Jackie will be prov providing a researcher's perspective um, around her research with culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Jackie, thanks so much for joining us today. Um, and over to you. Um, thanks so much. I've got slides because I'm nowhere near as engaging as those as the previous three women and I need a distraction. <laughs> um, so I would just like to start by saying that, you know, I'm a white researcher of Anglo-Saxon background um, and I'm also a doctor. So I think it's really important that we reflect on what our um, what our cultural lens is and how we see the world and um, really be aware of that when we're working with other uh, cultures. Um, I would also like to start by acknowledging the um, traditional owners of the lands on which I'm presenting today, so the Wandering people of the Kulin Nation. Um, can I have the next slide, please? Um, but really importantly, I would also like to acknowledge the people and elders from the Yongle and Larrakea nations in um, both Darwin and Northeast Arnhem Land. That was where I really, um, when I was living up there, where I first started doing research and I really learnt so much from the elders and people in those communities. So the two main projects that I started working with when I was working up there were um, both um, related to women's health and chronic disease. And there were Indigenous reference groups. There was extensive consultation um, prior to and during these research projects where uh, the Indigenous reference group had input into the format and design, into questionnaires and content, the sites, um, organize, where we did the screening, timing of visits, which languages that we were translating things into or engaging um, Aboriginal health workers who spoke those languages. How are we feeding, going to feedback results, um, which I think is a really important thing that often gets forgotten about in research. Um, so I learned a lot from that, from that process. Um, next slide, please. And the other thing that was really important up there was that the Human Research and Ethics Committee had a, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander subcommittee and with the power of veto. So you really had to put considerable thought into the conduct and process of how you were going to do your research 
And really, if you didn't have a consumer, a relevant consumer reference group, um, you usually wouldn't get your um, ethical approval. So um, it was a really wonderful start to, um, to, re to research. Um, next slide, please. And then I moved to Melbourne and I had kind of assumed that this approach was standard, uh, but clearly as we've heard already today, it's not. And, um, you know, I think that researchers often find, talk about how it's too hard, say that different populations are hard to reach, but I think as has already been discussed, it's not so much that people are hard to reach, but that, you know, we're not doing it properly and we need to develop trusting and respectful relationships. And I think has, has already been mentioned as well, it, it's um, just not acceptable that we're not undertaking research that leads to equitable outcomes when, uh, you know, has been mentioned that, you know, half of our population are either born overseas or have a parent who was born overseas. Thanks, next slide. So um, one of the projects that I first uh, uh, became involved with when I moved to Melbourne was around perinatal mental health. And that was because someone who'd been looking at pregnancy outcomes at Monash Health for people from ref both refugee and migrant backgrounds um, was really looking focused more on birth weights and preterm birth. But the really stark thing that stood out to us was that less than 5% of women were documented to have anxiety or depression in pregnancy. And we know that around a third of people of refugee uh, populations have uh, mental health issues due to a lot of the stresses that they experience both before and during and then in the resettlement process. Uh, and we also know that about 12 to 22% of women will have uh, some kind of um, mental illness in the perinatal period. So that really uh, just didn't make sense. And at Monash, the, the clinical, um, it's a clinical assessment. There was no screening um, as is done in many other health services. And part of the reason that they said that was because uh, they didn't feel it would be culturally acceptable. There was a lot of um, stigma around mental health and that there were issues with um, language and things like that in terms of doing screening, using some of the validated measures that were used in other hospitals. So we did some research with health providers, women in the community, interpreters and bicultural workers, all of whom really strongly supported better identification of um, mental health disorders for women and supporting them to get the help that they needed. And this was a quote from one of the interpreters who said that it's very, very necessary because it not only affects the woman herself, but the whole family. And if they fall, everybody falls. So um, that then gave us the um, the support that we needed to go on and develop a, um, a program. Next slide, please. Some of the things that had been identified around how we could support the program included um, skills and knowledge, beliefs about capabilities and consequences. Um, and we really needed to think quite carefully about all of these things when we were implementing this program. Next slide, please. So we um, had a consumer advisory group and we were really supported in engaging the, um, that group by AIMS and also by Monash Health, Refugee Health and Wellbeing. And we also had a steering group that included um, people from diverse disciplines, primary care and hospital care. Um, next slide, please. So they really informed how we approached this and addressing some of those things that was on that um, little wheel earlier. So one was around skills for training. So health providers were worried and they didn't want to cause more harm, understandably. So um, they we provided training for them on both mental health, but also working with um, refugee health um, and how to link people into services appropriately. We also um, ended up using, uh, and we worked with an NGO that had the screening measures on an iPad that could be done by women privately, so they didn't always need an interpreter. So we used translated resources or we translated and back translated and then tested them. And so they were available in eight languages at the time. Um, and the feedback that we had was that women really appreciated being able to do this in private, to have the time to, to undertake this. Um, and we did find that, um, 
with that advisory group that it really supported us to not only recruit women, but to provide um, a better service. And when we evaluated it, we found that around 30% of women had anxiety or depression symptoms in pregnancy, so not less than 5%. Um, and that most of them had seen, certainly the women of refugee background were then able to see the refugee health nurse where a lot of the a lot of the issues that they were dealing with were more psychosocial issues and being able to address them really alleviated a lot of anxiety that some of the women had. And one of the um, quotes from one of the women that was really um, struck home was that, you know, she said, you know, if you don't ask, I won't tell. Um, so I think we made a lot of assumptions about what women from, uh, you know, non-white backgrounds would want um, that weren't necessarily correct. Um, and so I think this project really highlighted the value of having a, you know, relevant consumer and community involvement group. Next slide, please. And I think some of the things that really facilitated this, was to, as was mentioned before, that we did have time. We had that advisory group. We actually had a key facilitator from Monash Health Refugee and Wellbeing who um, was the chair of that consumer advisory group, um, Razia Ali, who was really one of um, the key people in this research. We also had the support of um, the health service uh, and we had uh, bicultural health workers, budget for engagement, um, consumer advisory group and interpreters. And I think that all of those things really um, came, we had strong relationships across all of the groups. We had respect between all the groups and I think the health providers and the health service also had the confidence to go ahead with this because they weren't so worried about doing the wrong thing because they were getting constant um, input from the consumer advisory group. Next slide, please. So we have gone on to do some other work again with um, consumer and community advisory groups. And I think it's really important, particularly with the plethora of new digital health technologies that are coming in, that we really make sure that we don't exacerbate any in, um, inequity in health. Um, for example, when we looked at telehealth, you know, if you do most of the evaluations in telehealth have been surveys of women in English. Um, and really, we did some interviews with both women and interpreters to understand their experiences of telehealth, and they were vastly different to, um, to white women or women who spoke English who responded to surveys. Um, we, and, and advisory groups can be so informative at times. We, you know, we actually had someone from a, another project we're doing recently with remote monitoring um, of blood glucose in diabetes in pregnancy um, using an app. And um, they actually looked at the recruitment flyer and poster and things that we were doing. And one of them actually did up a little thing on Canva and sent it to us and said, you know, <laughs> you need something like this, um, which was fantastic. Um, thanks. Next slide. Um, so I think I would like to finish by saying that, um, you know, Yes, it can be difficult. Yes, it takes more time, but you know, the shared learnings um, are invaluable. We end up doing better research. As a clinician, I think it's so important because we're really helping to create better health outcomes and equity in health. It's fun. Um, and I think that we also need to remember that, um, so I was on a, uh, had an advisory group recently who said that um, inclusion is the beginning and not the end goal. And it is, um, I think, going back to what's been discussed earlier in this session, it's really about thinking how we can also do research differently, not just include different people in our current models. Um, so thank you. Ducky, thank you so much for your perspectives from a research, research lens. Terrific to hear about um, the work that you've been leading and, and some of your insights in working with communities in Melbourne, but also in, in other parts of Australia as well. Um, what we'd like to do now um, is Angela and I are going to facilitate um, picking up some of the questions that have come through um, in the Q&A and, uh, and just we'd invite all the members of our panel um, to perhaps turn their cameras back on and, uh, and to, uh, to feel free to respond um, to some of our questions. And we've got quite a number of that have come, uh, come through, haven't we, Angela? So I'm just gonna go. Um, a couple of them in the early part were, um, 
around some perspectives from FECA so we could offer to engage with uh, Muhammad and perhaps include some comments or feedback around those questions in the post-event um, post survey out. Um, but one of the questions is uh, around recruiting and retaining culturally and, and linguistically diverse consumers and as participants in longitudinal studies. So these are research studies that are happening over uh, a very long period of time. Sometimes, obviously, it's years. Um, and so I'm just wondering if our... Um, our, any of our speakers would like to uh, provide any perspectives in regard to that challenge? Um, I guess I'll bring this back to the point of having representatives from within those communities as part of your research team, as part of the recruitment process. It allows them to, I guess, build that rapport and, and relationship with the potential participants, especially for longitudinal studies that are going to be over time. Um, and just uh, if there's ways in which you involve the family, the carers in that process as well, I think that would perhaps um, provide a better success in retaining um, your consumers, your participants, sorry, I don't know if anyone else um, I haven't performed any longitudinal studies, so this is just my um, my uh, perception, I guess. From a consumer's point of view, um, I, I, I find when I'm on research projects, uh, the initial stages are fantastic. We're in contact, they're asking me all the questions, but then over time, communication drops off and I don't hear from them. And then all of a sudden they appear in my email or my inbox and I'm like, oh, what's going on? So it's about just keeping, like I had mentioned, social etiquette and networking 101, keep in contact, stay in touch. Even if you have nothing to update, just say you have nothing to update, but we have these other projects going on. Do you know anyone within the community who would be interested or, you know, X, Y, or if things aren't going right, sorry, we haven't been in contact or we haven't been in contact because X, Y, Z, I would prefer that than radio silence mm -hmm. because it would just, it, would, it sends the message that you don't care. And that, that, that mistrust comes back into the conversation again. So in order to have um, consumers on board long time, just stay in touch, connect with them. Communication is key. Thanks, Nadine. John, I can see you've got your hand up. Yes, look, I'd have to um, reiterate and support what, what's been said. You need to be considered as a member of a team and you need to be updated regularly. This is um, an, an element of um, <clears throat> communication which, which the research teams probably don't do enough of, um, feeding back the information to their consumer um, who is involved in that. So they're incorporated as a member of the team, so they've got to be involved in all the communication that's fed back because it keeps you up to date um, and, and, and again, it infers that there is a real trust because you're part of that team. Angela, I noticed that um, a couple of the questions relate to training, particularly for researchers around uh, working with um, diverse communities. Um, and I'm kind of interested, uh, given the work that uh, John, you've been involved with through the MRFF Consumer Panel and also through ACTA, whether this issue of um, training for researchers um, voluntarily or mandatory, because <laughs> that's also raised in the, in the questions, and whether it's been in, in any of the conversations you've had um, at the national level with some of these sort of lead, leading organisations. Um, yeah, look, it, it's, it's certainly front and centre. Um, Walter and Eliza Hall, WeHi in Melbourne, have a buddy system whereby they buddy up a consumer with a researcher and they talk about um, their research. They also talk about common goals that they might have together. You know, do they like movies? Do they like cooking? So there, there's a, a relationship developed. And I think as, as has previously been indicated all the way through, developing those relationships is really, really important. So so we WeHi have it's probably the best kind of blueprint out there at, at the moment. Um, but in terms of, of training, it's, it, it is a dual thing. We, we do need to be able to train consumers in understanding 
elements of clinical trials and research. It doesn't have to be um, all around, you know, the, the incredible scientific elements. Um, I've just been talking to researchers around radiotherapy. Well, that's a whole lot of statistics and stuff like that. Um, but about patient numbers, about the risks that are involved, all of those things are very important. And people who have been through the system, uh, been through the system, understand that consumers will take a risk. But we want to know the risks. You, you want to have percentages. We, we're good at all of that. We're good at telling a story that can improve outcomes and 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 engagement. And I think those are really important elements. Mm. Thanks, John. Um. Um, there's an interesting question in, in here around uh, the use of interpreters within communities and patient confidentiality and some of the sensitivities that might arise um, for both, I guess, for the, for the, for the consumer, the patient, um, with their relation, potential relationship and, and knowledge of the interpreter within the same community. Uh, well, have you had any experience where you've had to I don't know, um, even suggest a different interpreter because of your own potential conflicts of interest with someone you know? Absolutely, and that comes up very often in small communities, especially when we're talking about regional um, towns where that community is even smaller. But it's a part of our um, uh, uh, ethics um, uh, ethics within the profession to actually declare that knowledge that if you know that individual you have to make that known to the service provider or the, the, the organization that's booked you even if the client themselves don't have a um, they need to they need to be okay with you being there but you are obligated to announce that you you know them so there are many times where I've had clients that say they know me but I don't have any personal knowledge of them because it may have been that they've seen me do something, for example, whether it's online or whatever else. And when that when that consent comes from um, the uh, the individual um, who is from the from the from the community who requires the interpreting, then it's um it 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 sort of it it relieves that um, the responsibility of the interpreter. But I, I think that in um uh, in in smaller communities, even if you don't know the interpreter, just even um socializing in the same sort of groups or being a part of some of the, the, a similar sort of community activities and so on that can also be um, quite um, quite challenging uh, the good part about that or the solution to that is that um, there are um, language service providers you know whether it's um, you know TIS national or multicultural New South Wales who are able to provide interpreters that are um, uh, via audio visual visual link so if you don't have an interpreter that's if you have an interpreter who's local to a small community in regional areas you're still able to access somebody you know via video link or via phone from somewhere else in australia which um makes that problem very easy to solve yeah thank you thank you Ala. um jackie i i noticed there are also some comments in in the questions that um, with refugee communities it can sometimes be quite hard to find interpreters in some specific language groups. Um, have you ha had that kind of experience yourself? Is that a question for me? I was actually asking Jackie, but um, Awa, if you've been involved, please feel free to comment. Um, I, I do have something to, to, to share with you about that um, with regards to the hard to service languages. That's what they're sort of, um, you know, title within our space so um what the wonderful initiative that was by the um, previous government which is to add a bit of funding towards improving interpreting and translating services in new south wales so this is a, a state initiative um uh, has actually allowed uh, multicultural new south wales to be able to build that capacity and um, at the moment there is a scholarship um, program uh, which exists around um, uh, being able to increase uh, the services of um, interpreters and translators in very difficult to service languages. So we're in the process basically of mapping out this whole um, journey with um, being able to uh, educate and train um, people from, from communities who speak particular languages and being able to bring them into a professional space and being able to provide that service for their community. So this is active work, it's currently happening. Um, we do find that there is a large number of um, uh, languages that 
that are difficult to service. So there's a demand in the community, but the professionals that can provide that service can be um, sometimes quite challenging. So that work is happening. Um, and um, it's, it's, it's actually, um, it's very positive to see that there is progress um, uh, even only two years into it. So there was a pilot of about, um, for about four years, but now we're in the crux of actually mapping this out for it to be hopefully, uh, to be a continued source of training for all the different languages that come, um, you know, um, from out from migration patterns and so on. We work very closely with um, settlement services and um, and other uh, and other departments so that we can make that work more targeted. Hmm. Thank you, uh, Jackie. Did you have anything you wanted to add? Uh, no, I think we've been quite fortunate because uh, most of the work that we've done has been tied to a health service, so we've been able to access um, the interpreters from the health service. Angela, have you picked yeah. up any other questions? Yeah, absolutely. And there's a question there around uh, just hearing from the panel around avenues to raise awareness within communities about the benefits of participating in research um, and whether you might have some suggestions for our webinar attendees today around um, how they might approach that. Um. So there are a few um, resources that have been developed already in different languages. Um, if we're looking at uh, cancer specific examples, you have Cancer Institute New South Wales. Um, in terms of clinical trials in general, I think Monash University had developed a few videos. Um, just, I guess on the topic of developing resources, I would encourage that if you are going to create videos, um, have both the um, the text in language at the bottom as well as the audio in language um, because just to improve accessibility in case people cannot read, at least they can hear it. Um, and co-designing any messaging, not only with uh, people from within the community, but also um, translators and interpreters. So Arwa very kindly invited me to an event um, early last week with the um, Arabic Translators and Interpreters Association here in Sydney. And um, one of the key themes and, and points that was um, emphasized was that um, translators will accurately translate your English to your Arabic or whatever language, but coherence was a major issue. And that's because they're, they're providing that um, translation, that literal translation that you want, but when, um, I guess the message is literally getting lost in the translation, and so your message is no longer coming across the way you want it to, um, so coherence was a major issue which could be resolved if we have those translators or interpreters involved in the co-design process very early on rather than just contracting them at the end to translate your document or whatever it is. Um, there are some innovative ways to engage with communities. So a couple of weeks back, I presented at another um, webinar with a um, researcher from, I think she was from Brazil, and she was using um, soap operas to um, relay important information about health and research. And I actually found the um, Arabic equivalent here in Sydney. I met him at that event that Arwa invited me to. Um, and he's um, promoting mental health information through theatrical productions um, that are being put on show um, at local community um, centres um, here in Southwest Sydney. So yeah, think outside of the box. Um, and I I'm sure you'll, you'll come to a solution in one way or another. Absolutely. That sounds fantastic, Ryan. <laughs> um, I think I might just add a little bit to that. Sorry, Nadine, you've got, oh, sorry, Anne John, you've got your hand up, but I'll just add to that. Utilize people from within the communities that you're trying to connect with that already have um, power or influence when it comes to, you know, we talk about influencers and we talk about people who are well known within those communities, maybe outside their, those communities, they may not, may not be as popular, but they have they have pull. They've got impact. Utilize them because if you want to get your message out there, what better what better platform to use than somebody who already has that established um, you know attention? People are already sort of engaged with them online or whatever else. So find those role models. Find those um, you know um, uh, you know uh, ex football players. Find those you know um, uh, act what perform poets whatever whatever it is that you need to utilize do it because they're um they're a great way in they're an absolute great way in 
John, I can see you've got your hand up there. Uh, I'm an ex-footballer, but uh, I don't know whether I would fit the, fit the bill at the moment. Um, one, one of the things that uh, I've been um, thinking about for, for, for some time and even approached, um, I, again, we have the, the federated system, so state um, health services, to have videos or information in the foyers of the public hospitals. Most people go to, to public hospitals at some time and have information about research and clinical trials. Um, some people have said, look, you know, the large medical centres that do that, but clinical trials and research probably don't happen as much at GP, at GP level. It's more at, at the tertiary level. So, you know, sometimes when you go into a hospital, you know, the Leukaemia Foundation will have information there, myeloma or lung cancer groups, then perhaps some community groups can have information there about clinical trials and research as and the impact and the positive impact it could have on, on, on their um, populations. So that's just, again, thinking a bit outside the square. The onus then falls on the health system, but I think that's where it should come from. So I think that's probably another way which we can look at uh, engaging with those people. I think that's a great point, John, when people are receiving healthcare in, in hospitals or other settings, it's a great opportunity, isn't it, to open up the conversation about research and to um, build the community's understanding about research and, and some of its benefits and some of the research opportunities that might um, enhance their health. Absolutely. Um, I, I know it's the case here in Victoria and many other states across Australia where there are um, quite significant culturally and linguistically diverse communities in rural and regional parts of our state of Australia now. Um, and there's a, a, a question that's come through around um, some practical or, you know, tangible things that can be done to we're trying to obviously to move towards um, offering clinical trials more broadly uh, across Australia to benefit all, everyone who lives in Australia, but um, it's more challenging in rural and regional areas and, and also with significantly uh, diverse communities in those areas as well. So just if our panellists had any suggestions around um, how can we how we can move to stronger engagement in regional and rural Australian Australian areas? Um, well, look, te telehealth and teletrials is is being discussed, and and some of the you know the major clinical trials groups are are using are using telehealth and te teletrials, and I think that will probably open up um, a new area that hasn't been. Um, addressed much. Um, if we look at some of the trials, um, uh, you do need to have access to, to, to a tertiary hospital or, or um, you know, someplace where, where, the, where the trial can be administered appropriately. And I think that it's then up to um, researchers to look at other ways of administering that. But telehealth and teletrials is, is I think, underutilised and, and I think will be used more. And just in addition to um, what John was saying, um, and I apologise for anyone who's attending my presentation later tonight, but a lot of this will be repeated. I'm going to sound like a bit of a broken record. Um, cold is very broad. It's a broad category with lots of communities within that. And so my advice is to get to know your population better, get to know who are the people that are accessing your services in those regional hubs um, and start with one, maybe two communities and then slowly build up. Don't overwhelm yourself with trying to recruit everyone um, from an ethnically diverse community. Um, and so by get to know your population better, I mean uh, who, you know, which um, cold group is um present in the highest numbers, or if you have a disease um, specific uh, research trial, who are the likely um, people to be affected by this condition? And that's where you'd want to start with and then slowly build yourself up. Thank you, Ryan. I'm mindful that we're almost coming up to 12.30 and to the end of our webinar today. And I just wanted um, to just some closing remarks. Um, I think our speakers have touched on some uh, some terrific points around um, 
around what we need to be thinking about. Um, Muhammad and, and John talked about the work that's being led at a national level through ACTA and through the MRFF around the frameworks and principles to guide the research community. Um, and I think that work is really, really important. It was terrific then to hear from uh, Nadine, Ryan and Awa around uh, their partnership and what that looks like uh, in real life and the, and the translation of those principles into a team that is, is working with culturally and linguistically diverse communities and uh, your your practical suggestions, I think, were inspiring and invaluable. And thank you so much for, for sharing your, your wisdom. Um, I personally have learned an enormous amount by listening to you today. And I know that uh, the feedback from others on the line has been very, um, very positive as well around those fundamental things around taking a long-term view, around taking a time to build relationships, how important trust is. Um, we're working at the intersection of culture and language and faith and how that impacts on significantly on decisions around healthcare and participation in research and how so often we fail to take those those perspectives into account in the course of providing healthcare and, and, and in doing research as well. Um, and, and thanks also to Jackie for highlighting the way that she's worked with uh, refugee communities across the southeast of Melbourne, where she encountered many, many of those challenges and, and how important it is to bring to this work um, an awareness of our own, our own history and our own culture as well, and, and not to ignore that, but to be open to that as well. So thank you so much to everybody. We will capture a recording and a brief summary of um, the key points that have been made today. Um, we'll circulate that to all who registered and that those resources will also be made available on the Monash Partners and Sydney Health Partners website. Um, please contact Angela or I if you have suggestions about future webinars. Um, we're very open to your ideas um, and we thank you for your time today. Thanks everyone and thanks to our speakers. Really thanks. great session.